So this is part three on our Gospel of the Holy Twelve. We are going to be reading through sections five and six. That is lections or verses 41 through 60. So starting with section five, lection 41. Jesus setteth free the caged birds, the blind man who denied that others saw. And Jesus was going to Jericho. There met him a man with a cage full of birds, which he had caught, and some doves. And he saw how they were in misery, having lost their liberty, and moreover being tormented with hunger and thirst. He said unto the man, What dost thou with these? And the man answered, I go to make my living by selling these birds which I have taken. And Jesus said, What thinkest thou if another stronger than thou or with greater craft were to catch thee and bind thee or thy wife or thy children and cast thee into a prison in order to sell thee into captivity for his own profit and make a living? In my opinion, that sounds a little bit like what we would call human trafficking today. Are not these thy fellow creatures only weaker than thou? And doth not the same God, our father, mother, care for them as for thee? Let thee, thy little brethren and sisters, go forth into freedom and see that thou do this thing no more, but provide honestly for a living. So once again, Jesus is referring to the creatures of the earth, our animals, as our brothers and sisters. Again, as we talked about last week in this gospel, he's often saying that the same breath that we breathe is the same breath as the animals, that God created them as conscious living beings, as his children, just as he created man to be his children. Verse 5 goes on and said, And the man marveled at these words and at his authority, and he let the birds go free. So when the birds came forth, they flew unto Jesus and stood on his soldier, shoulder and sang unto him. And the man inquired further of his doctrine, and he went his way and learned the craft of making baskets. And by this craft, he earned his bread, and afterwards he brake his cages and his traps, and he became a disciple of Jesus. And I just want to point out throughout this whole um, gospel, the name Jesus is spelt the way that it would have been spelled back in this time. Jesus is the English adaptation of this person we call Jesus' name. His actual name, as most people know, was Yahshua. We also see a lot of the other disciples' names throughout this gospel spelled in their correct way. Obviously, names like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not typical names you would have seen in the Middle East at this time. And so I do want to make that, that clear that as I read this, I am reading the English adaptation of the names. All right, it goes on with verse seven. And Jesus beheld a man working on the Sabbath. And he said unto him, man, if thou knowest not the law in spirit, but if thou knowest not, thou art accursed and a transgressor of the law. And Jesus said unto his disciples, What shall be done unto these servants who, knowing their Lord's will, prepare not themselves for coming, neither do according to his will? Verily I say unto you, Thou that know thy master's will, and do it not, shall be beaten with many stripes. But they who do not know their master's will, do it not, shall be beaten but with a few stripes. To whomever much is given, of them much is required, and to whom little is given from them, little is required. My mother used to say that all the time growing up to us, for whom much is given, much is expected. Verse 10 says, And there was a certain man who was blind from birth, and he denied that there were such things as the sun, moon, and stars, or that color existed. And they tried in vain to persuade him that other people saw them. And then they led him to Jesus, and he anointed his eyes and made him see. And he greatly rejoiced with the wonder and fear, and confessed that before he was blind. And now after this, he said, I see, I know everything, I am God. God with a lowercase g. And Jesus said unto him, How canest thou know all? Thou canest not see through the walls of thine house, nor read the thoughts of thy fellow men, nor understand the language of the birds or of beasts. 
thou canst not even recall the events of thy former life, conception, or birth. So once again, we have this indication of a reincarnation, that we are blind to our own story, our ego within the confines of this one particular life will not allow sometimes our spirit to understand that our spirit is eternal and keeps coming back again in this cycle of life. So very interesting. I know from my own studies of the ancient Christian faith that reincarnation was very much spoken about in the early Christian church. You can actually find references to reincarnation in the canonized Bible in the book of Luke. Verse 13 says, remember with humility now, how much remains unknown to thee, ye unsee, and doing so, thou mayest see more clearly. So we see more clearly when we're more humble to the fact that we don't know anything really. So we're going to go on to lection 42, Jesus teach us concerning marriage and the blessing of children. And it came to pass that when Jesus was finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came to the coast of Judea beyond Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away a wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto unto them, In some nations one man hath many wives, and putteth away whom he will for a just cause. And in some a woman hath many husbands, and putteth away whom she will for a just cause. And in others one man is joined to one woman in mutual love, and this is the first and the better way. Now, remember prior to this, we encountered the woman who committed adultery, and that is the same story from the Bible where Jesus said, ye who is without sin may cast the first stone. So he's really emphasizing that no man should have multiple wives, no woman should have multiple husbands, and neither one of them should be putting the other away, as in stoning or whatever, because this should be mutual love, that that A man and a woman or a couple should be one unit in spirit. In verse 4, he says, For have ye not read that God who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man or a woman leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife or his husband and they shall be one flesh. So again, children leave their parents and then mate with their partner and become one flesh. None is greater than the other. It's mutual love. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God have joined together, let no man put asunder. That sounds familiar, right? That's in the marriage vows. Verse six says, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement? He saith unto them, Moses became of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, even as he permitted you to eat flesh for many causes. From the beginning, this was not so. So he's pointing out that Moses made some mistakes because Moses was was a man. He was corruptible, just like all men are fallible. Even the best of men are also fallible and corruptible goes on in verse 7, And I say unto you, whoever shall put away a wife, except it be for a just cause, shall marry another in her place, committeth adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of a man to be with his wife is not good to marry. But he say unto them, All cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some celibates who were born from their mother's womb, and there are some which were made celibates of men, and there are some who have made themselves celibates for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive, let him receive them. And I also have to say with like divorce, I don't think that God um, cares if we divorce because of abuse or because of any other bad, bad, bad things within a marriage. Because remember God, Jesus, before the divorce statement said that you have to love each other. Like there has to be love there. And when there's cruelty or abuse, there is no love. So I'm thinking when the whole divorce thing, he's really condemning the idea of, oh my God, you're just bored with your wife. And so you're divorcing her for someone else. If that is adultery. I don't believe that when there is no love in the marriage or there is as, as trauma in the marriage and there needs to be divorce to keep somebody safe. I believe that that is totally fine 
with God. Verse 9 says, Then there came unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and bless them. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and blessed them. And then he entered into a certain village. There he met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that they, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face and at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, saying, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are there nine? There are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. So after these lepers were healed, these ten lepers, only one came back to give thanks to God. Interesting. Lection 43. Jesus teacheth concerning the riches of the world and the washing of hands and the eating of unclean meats. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments, he saith unto him, which be they? And Jesus said, What teachest Moses? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things I kept from up my youth, what lack I yet. And Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast in abundance and give to those who have not. And thou shalt have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. But the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions, ye more than satisfied his needs. Then Jesus said unto his disciple, Verily I say unto you, that the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the gates of a needle's eye than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But his disciples heard that they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, For the carnal mind that is impossible, but with the spiritual mind all things are possible. So again, it's not, David and I talked about this, it is not money, it is not being rich that is bad. It's the love of the money, it's the love of the riches that are bad. It's it's being able to depart with your possessions and be okay with it because it's your spirit that you're trying to make whole, not your earthly flesh. Again, this goes back to some gnosis, which we're going to see a lot of this idea of gnosis or inner knowledge. Verse 7 says, And I say unto you, make not yourself friends of the mammon, again, mammon is worldly possessions, of unrighteousness that were ye fail, that may receive you into their earthly habitations, but rather of the true riches, even the wisdom of God, so that ye may be received into everlasting mansions, which fade not away. Again, that's referring to gnosis. And then Peter said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit at the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But the things of this world is not mine to give you. So God is not of the earthly world. Again, that is the nature world. And it's interesting, he says the regeneration. It's like we talked about that last week, the regeneration of the soul, this idea that the soul keeps living, that we keep living and growing. It's not a, a do or die situation. It's a growing relationship with God throughout each life. 
Verse 9 says, And every one that hath forsaken riches, houses, friends, for the kingdom of heaven's sake and its righteousness shall receive a hundredfold in the age to come and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and many that are last shall be first. And there came unto him a certain scribe of the Pharisees who had seen one of his disciples eat with unwashed hands. And they found fault, for the Jews eat not except they have the first wash in their hands, and many other things observe they in the washing of the cups and of the vessels of the tables. And they said, Why walk not all thy disciples in the tradition of the elders? For we saw one who did eat with unwashed hands." And Jesus said, Well, hath Moses commanded you to be clean and keep your bodies clean and keep your vessels clean, but ye have added things which oftentimes cannot be observed by everyone at all times and all places. Hearken unto thee, therefore, not only unclean things entering into the body of man defile man, but much more do evil thoughts and unclean which pour from the heart of man defile their inner man and defile others also. Therefore, take heed of your thoughts and cleanse your hearts and let your food be pure. So the cleanliness isn't just referring to the physical body being clean. Actually, in all spiritual faith, they talk about the physical body being clean. Yoga, especially, we are to clean all the time. But that's just um, the matter being clean. We're talking about purity of what we eat. So not eating meat. Again, that's what he's saying. You're defiling yourself by eating dead animals that were God's children too, but also keeping your thoughts pure as well. Verse 15 says, these things ought ye to do and not leave the others undone. Whoso breaketh the law of purification of necessity are blameless for they do not of their own will, neither despising the law, which is just and good for cleanliness in all things is great pain. But ye not followers of evil fashion, for the world even in appearance, for many are led into evil by the outward seeing and the likeness of evil. And this brings us now to section 5, election 44. Again, we're reading from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, one of the banned books of the Bible. Lection 44 says the confession of the Twelve. In this Gospel, we are going to see a lot of information pertaining to the corruption of the church today. Verse 1 says, Again Jesus sat near the sea in a circle of twelve palm trees, where he oft resorted. And the twelve and their fellows came upon him, and they sat under the shade of the tree, and the Holy One taught them sitting in their midst. And Jesus said unto them, Ye have heard what men in the world say concerning me, but whom do you say that I am? Peter rose up with Andrew his brother and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who descendeth from heaven and dwelleth in the hearts of them who believe and obey unto righteousness. And the rest rose up and said, each after his own manner, These words are true, so we believe. And Jesus answered them, saying, Blessed are ye, my twelve, who believe, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but the Spirit of God, which dwelleth in you. I indeed am the way, the truth, and the light, and the truth understandeth all things. So again, this is another reference to gnosis or inner knowing, the flesh and blood being matter, being property, and the spirit being something completely different. Again, that's Purusha from the East. Verse four says, and all the truth is in God. I bear witness unto the truth. I am the true rock, and on this rock I do build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And out of this rock shall flow rivers of living water to give life to people of the earth. Ye are my chosen twelve. In me, the head and the cornerstone are the twelve foundations of my house, builded on the rock. And on you and me shall my church be built. And in truth and righteousness shall my church be established. And ye shall sit on twelve thrones and send forth light and truth to all the twelve tribes of Israel after the Spirit. And I will be with you even unto the end of the world. Verse 7 says, and this is an important one, guys. This, to me, resonates with what's happening today in our world. But there shall arise after you men of perverse mind, who shall through ignorance or thought craft suppress many things which I have spoken unto you and lay to me things which I never taught, 
sowing tars among the good wheat which I have given you to sow in the world. Then, the, then shall the truth of God endure the contradictions of sinners, for thus it hath seen, and thus it will be. But the time cometh when the things which they have hidden shall be revealed and made known, and the truth shall make free those which were bound. One is your master, all ye are brethren, and one is not greater than another in the place which I have given unto you. For ye have one master, even in Christ, who is over you, and with you, and in you. And there is no inequality among my twelve and their fellows. All are equally near unto me. Strive ye not therefore for the first place. For ye are all first, because ye are the foundation stones and pillars of the church, built on the truth which is in me and in you, and the truth in the law shall ye establish for all, as shall be given unto you. Verily, when you and your fellows agree together, touching anything in my name, I am in the midst of you and with you. Woe is the time when the spirit of the world entereth into the church, and my doctrines and preceits are made void through the corruption of men and women. Woe is the world when the light is hidden. Woe is the world when things shall be. That's the time we're living in. It started with Constantine and here we are now. We know that the church is corrupt. We, we know that. We just, we know it. Verse 13 says, At that time Jesus lifted his voice and said, I thank thee, O most righteous parent, creator of heaven and earth. And though these things are hidden from the wise and the prudent, they are nevertheless revealed unto babes. No one knoweth thee, save the Son, who is the daughter of man. No one know the daughter or the Son, save they whom the Christ is revealed, who is the two and one. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest upon your souls. For my yoke is equal, and it is easy, and my burden is light. So he's saying that his yoke is equal. That reminds me a lot of the um, Gospel of Thomas, where Thomas was Didymus, or the twin, where Jesus was saying that we are also children of God, just as he is, that we are his twin in God's eyes. So this goes down to lection 45, seeking for signs, the unclean spirit. Verse 1 says, Then certain of the scribe and of the parrot, a Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Yea, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth, and after he shall rise again. Verse 3 says, the men of Nineveh, and Nineveh is what we would call Iraq today, it's modern day Iraq, shall rise in judgment with this generation out and, and shall condemn it because they repent at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. It's interesting because there's a lot happening with like Iraq and Iran right now that is definitely under the surface of our underlying uh World War Three, as it were, that we're in right now. Most people listening to this are totally aware of what I'm talking about. Verse 4 says, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she come from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Again, he said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of any, he walketh through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, it saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty and swept and garnished. For they ask not the good spirit to dwell within them and be their great eternal guest. Then he goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of all such is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation, which refuseth entrance to the Spirit of God. For I say unto you, whoever so blasphemeth the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven then. But whose blasphemeth the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. 
them either in this age or the next, for they resistant the light of God by the false tradition of men. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his parents and his brethren and his sisters stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and thy sisters, and without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my father and who is my mother? And who are my brethren and my sisters? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciple and said, Behold my father and my mother, my brethren and sisters and my children. For who shall ever shall do the will of my parent who is in heaven, the same is my father and mother and my brother and my sister and my son and my daughter. And there were some Pharisees who were covetous and proud of their riches and said unto them, Take heed unto yourselves and beware of covetous. For a man's life is consistent not in the abundance of the thing which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will do. I will pull down my barn and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take time easy and drink and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy life shall be required of thee. Then who shall thee those things be which thou hast provided? So are they to lay up treasures for themselves, and are not rich in good works to them that needed, but are in want? So we see a lot here in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. We see a lot about vegetarianism, not eating meat. We also see a lot about making sure we're not putting all of our desire into worldly possessions. Again, I don't believe that money is evil itself. I don't think it's it's wrong to be rich. I think it's the love of money. It's the desire to have money and power over all things that is evil. After all, rich people are the people that give us jobs that keep the economy going. You know, um, I never got a job from a poor man. So um, so money itself is not wrong. It's just the idea of, of hoarding that money that is wrong. Lection 46 is the transfiguration on the mount, the giving of the law. After six days, when the feast of the tabernacle was night at hand, Jesus taketh the twelve and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart. And he was praying in the fashion of his countenance was changed. He was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and he was white as the light. This reminds me a lot of the um, Bhagavad Gita with uh, Arjuna and Krishna when Krishna transforms in front of Arjuna. And it becomes so powerful that Arjuna can't look at him because his human eyes cannot behold the sight of the purity of God. Verse 2 says, And behold, there appeared unto Moses and Isaiah, talking with him in spade of the law of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. So Moses and Isaiah is um, talking with God, with Jesus, and they're talking about this law where his death would accomplish his life, and that would happen in Jerusalem. Interesting. Verse 3 says, And Moses spake, saying, This is of whom I foretold, saying, A prophet from the midst of thy brethren, like unto you shall the eternal send unto you, and that which is eternal speaketh unto him, shall he speak unto you, and unto him shall he hearken. And those will not obey, shall bring themselves to their own destruction. Then Peter said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Isaiah. While he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and 12 rays as the sun issued from behind the cloud and voice came out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell into their faces and they swore amazed. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only, and the six glories were seen upon him. 
Verse 7 says, And Jesus said unto them, Behold, a new law I give unto you, which is not new, but old. Even as Moses gave the Ten Commandments to Israel after the flesh, so I give unto you the twelve for the kingdom of Israel after the Spirit. For who are the Israel of God? Even they of every nation and tribe who work righteousness, love mercy, and keep my commandments. These are the true Israel of God. And standing upon his feet, Jesus spake, saying, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah thy God is one. Many are my seers and my prophets. In me all live and move and have substance. Ye shall not take away the life of any creature for your pleasure, nor for your profit, nor yet torment it. Ye shall not steal the goods of any, nor gather land and riches to yourself beyond your need or use. Ye shall not eat the flesh, nor drink the blood of any slaughtered creature, nor yet anything which bringeth disorder to your help or senses. Uh, well, there you go. We shouldn't be wearing masks then, because <laughs> masks don't allow us to breathe, right? Ye shall not make impure marriages where love and health are not, nor yet corrupt themselves or any creature made pure by holy. Ye shall not bear false witness against any, nor willingly deceive any by a lie to hurt them. Ye shall not do unto others as ye would not do unto others should do unto you. Ye shall worship one eternal, the Father, Mother, and Heaven, of whom all things, and receive thy holy name. Ye shall revere your fathers and your mothers on earth, whose care is for you, and all the teachers of righteousness. Ye shall cherish and protect the weak and those who are oppressed and all creatures that suffer wrong. Ye shall work with your hands the things that are good and seemingly so shall ye eat the fruits of the earth and live long in the land. Ye shall purify yourselves daily and rest on the seventh day from labor, keeping holy the Sabbath and the festival of your God. So remember the Sabbath was always Saturday. It was Constantine that changed it to Sunday, which Sunday is again the day of the sun god or Ra or Horus. So again, we see a reference again back to Saturday or the Sabbath. Ye shall do unto others as you would do that others should do unto you. He's repeated that twice now. That's super important, right? We all learned that when we were in kindergarten. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. That's a, the golden rule, right? And we see he's repeated this now twice. Very important. And when the disciples heard these words, they smote upon their breasts, saying, Wherein we have offended, O God, forgive us. And may thy wisdom, love, and truth with in us incline our hearts to love and keen this holy law. Because again, we, we see Jesus talking about the, the main law being one of love. And David and I spoke about that last week. It's like the two commandments we see in the canonized Bible, where Jesus says, love thy God with all thy heart and love each other as I have loved you. If you do things in love, in pure love for other people, which is the face of God, that pure love, then you will, you will keep all the commandments because you don't want to hurt anybody. You want to, you want to treat people the way that people should be treated. Verse 23 says, and Jesus said unto them, my yoke is equal and my burden light. If ye will to bear it to you, it will be easy. Lay no other burden on those that enter into the kingdom, but only these necessary things. This is the law unto Israel of God, and the law is within. For it is the law of love, and it is not new but old. Take heed that ye add nothing to this law, and neither take away from it. Verily I say unto you, they who believe and obey this law shall be saved, and they who know it and obey it not shall be lost. It's interesting, we're coming into a time with the Nasara where we're going to be going back to common law or constitutional law. Right now, we are, as most people understand, we are under maritime law, not just here in America, but all over the world. And constitutional law, or common law, is a law of divinely inspired understanding. It's basically, you don't steal from me, I don't steal from you. You don't hurt me, I don't hurt you. You don't murder me, I don't murder you. Very, very simple, right? It's pretty much what God is saying here. These laws of love also bring back sovereignty to every man in every nation. Verse 25 said, but as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall make all be alive. We've talked about that before. 
the God of the Israelites, which again, he talked about the Israelites, right? Being everyone, not just the people of Israel, but all people who adhere to the law of love. And Christ is the one that came to serve the God of life, not the God of death. And the disobedient shall be purged through many fires, and they who persist shall descend and shall perish eternally. And as they came down from the mountains, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes of Eliza must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, truly shall come first and restore all things. And I say unto you that Isaac is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer to them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke upon them, John the Baptist. This is referenced in the book of Luke as well. And I actually remember this from Bible studies. Um, in the book of Luke, there is a reference to um, the same story where Jesus takes his disciples up onto the mountain and is talking to them. And he says that, you know, John the Baptist, he's, he was Elijah. He came back. Um, that's reincarnation. And we've seen that spoken about here in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve as well. And of course, as I've said, there are references to reincarnation in the canonized Bible, if you look at them closely and read them for what they are, of course, they don't use the word reincarnation, but the word reincarnation is just the vocabulary word to describe the returning of a spirit, the returning of a soul. And in my opinion, that makes more sense coming from a loving God. It doesn't change the faith in God. It doesn't change the core belief in Jesus. It just means that our lives on earth are longer and possibly more complex than we know they are when we're in a particular life. I hope that makes sense. Lection 47 says, the spirit giveth light, the rich man and the beggar. And when they came down from the mount, one of his disciples asked him, Master, if a man keep not all these commandments, shall he enter into life? And he said, the law is good, and the letter without the spirits is dead, but the spirit maketh the letter alive. Take ye heed, and ye obey from heart, in the spirit of love, and all the commandments which I have given unto you. It hath been written, Thou shalt not kill, but I say unto you, If any hate and desire to slay, they are guilty of the law. If they cause hurt or torture any innocent creature, they are guilty. But if they kill to put an end to suffering, which cannot be healed, they are not guilty. But if they do it quickly and in love. So again, if you have to kill, if you're being attacked or you see something su suffering, he's reiterating. If you have to kill to extend mercy, if you see an animal that's on death's door and it's in pain and you have to put it out of its misery, or if you have to protect yourself, you do it quickly. You do it in mercy. You don't torment anything. It hath been said, thou shalt not steal, but I say unto you, if any not content with which they have, desire and seek after which is another's, or if they withhold that which is from the worker, they have stolen in their heart already. And our guilt is greater than that of one who slayeth a loaf in necessity to satisfy his hunger. So again, it's that wanting that gluttony, that wanting of, of greed of, of another's, that jealousy, that's also a sin. That's hard to do, right? It's hard to not be jealous. Verse 5 says, Again ye have been told, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, If a man or woman join together in marriage with unhealthy bodies and beget unhealthy offspring, they are guilty, even though they have not taken their neighbor's spouse. And if any have not taken a woman who belongeth to another, but desire in their hearts and seek after her, they have committed adultery in spirit. And again, I say unto you, if any desire and seek to possess the body of any creature for food or for pleasure or for profit, they defile themselves thereby. Ye, and if a man telleth to his neighbor in such wise as to lead him to evil, even though it may be true in the letter, he is guilty. Walk ye in spirit, and thus shall ye fulfill the law and be meet for the kingdom. Let the law be within your own hearts, rather than on tables of the memorial, which things nevertheless ye ought to do, and not to leave others undone. For the law which I have given unto you is holy, just, and good, and blessed are all they who obey and walk therein. So that reminds me like, you know, like in um, modern times and you know, growing up in the Presbyterian church, I'm sure this is true of all 
the uh, flavors of Christianity, the de denominations of Christianity, and probably all religions, if I'm being completely honest. People are kind of grandfathered into a faith, right? It's just your culture. It's what you know. We've talked about that on the Dark Outpost, being um, Protestant here in the South, um, where we are mostly Protestant, very few Catholics, but mostly Protestant. It's a social thing. It's a social gathering. It's a part of your cultural surrounding. And so Jesus is saying that when you leave the law on the table of the memorial, so like the laws are spoken about in the church, but they're not practiced really during the week. That makes sense to me. You see that a lot. And that's why I feel like the church and probably all religions have become corrupted because it looks like the, the heart of Christianity as well as a lot of other religions is this idea of love and being in love and mercy. And human beings sometimes have a hard time doing that. So that's interesting that he's already talking about that 2,000 years ago. I guess that it's true that humans just never change, right? So verse 9 says, God is spirit, and they who worship God must worship in spirit, in truth, at all times and in all places. And he spake this parable unto them who were rich, saying, There are certain rich men who clotheth in purple and fine linens in fared every day. Okay, so we talked about purple. That's the, um, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, right? Because of the, the dye that's on that area of the world, the purple dye. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The dogs were taking care of Lazarus. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried with great pomp. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his place. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And thus are the changes of life for the perfecting of souls. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence till their time be accomplished." And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send me him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into his place of torment. Abraham said unto him, Thy have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And they say, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be perished, though one rose from the dead. Lection 48, Jesus feedeth 100 with five melons, heals the withered hand on the Sabbath day. And it came to pass, as Jesus had been teaching the multitudes, and they were hungry and faint by reason of the heat of the day, and there passed by one that way a woman on a camel laden with melons and other fruits. And Jesus lifted upon his voice and cried, O ye that thirst, seek ye the living water which cometh from heaven. For this is the water of life, which those who drink it thirst not again. And he took the fruits, five melons, and divided them among the people, and they ate. And their thirst was quenched. And he said unto them, If God maketh the sun to shine, and the water to fill out these fruits of the earth, shall not the same be the sun of your souls, and fill you with the water of life? Seek ye the truth, and let your souls be satisfied. The truth of God is that water which cometh from heaven without money and without price, and they who drink shall be satisfied. And those whom he fed were one thousand men, women, and children, and none of them went home hungered or athirst, and many that had fevered were healed. And at this time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the cornfields, and his disciples were and hungered and began to plunk the ears of the corn to eat. And when the fair feet Pharisees saw this, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciple, do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was hungered, and they, that 
and that were with him how he entered into the house of God and did eat the bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read the law, how on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple do the work on the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you, that is the place, is O great than the temple. So he's obviously p pointing out the hypocrisy, right? That if, you know, rules for me, but not for thee, if you got to work on the Sabbath, you got to work on the Sabbath, right? Verse nine says, but if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have commend commended these guiltless for the son of man is the Lord even in the Sabbath. And he was departed thence and went into their synagogues and behold, there was a man which had in his hand withered. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? And they might accuse him. And he said unto them, What shall there be among you that shall have but one sheep? And if it fall into the pit of the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? And if ye give help to sheep, shall ye not also be a man that needeth? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. Then saith he to the man, Stretched forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored to the whole like as the other. So Jesus is healing again. When the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and a great multitude followed him. And he healed their sick and infirmed, and charged them that they should not make it known. So it was fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my ser servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall sow judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench till he sent forth judgment unto victory and his name shall be the Gen the Gentiles shall trust. That's me. I'm a Gentile. <laughs> Lection 49, the true temple of God. And the feast of the Passover was at hand and it came to pass that some of the disciples being Masons were set to prepare repair, excuse me, one of the chambers of the temple. And Jesus said, Yea, it is beautiful and well wrought are the stones, for the time cometh when not one stone shall be left on another, for the enemy shall overthrow both the city and the temple. Little foreshadowing as to what's to come with the Jewish war. But the temple is the body of a man in which God dwelleth by the spirit. And when the temple is destroyed in three days, God raiseth up a more glorious temple, which the eye of the natural man perceiveth not. So again, he's also referring to the temple not really being a place, but being us, our bodies. Know ye not that ye are the temples of the Holy Spirit? And whoso destroyeth one of these temples shall be himself destroyed. And some of the scribes hearing him sought to entangle him in his talk and said, If thou wouldest put away the sacrifice of sheep and oxen and birds, to what purpose was this temple built for God by Solomon, which has been now 40, 60 years and restoring? So they're talking about like how there were animal sacrifices happening in the temple. And now Jesus is really hammering the point not to do that. And now they've been spending all this time restoring this temple, but it's going to be destroyed anyway. Like, what's the point? And Jesus answered and said, It is written in the prophets, My house shall be called a house of prayer of all nations, for the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. But ye have made it a house of slaughter and filled it with abominations. Yeah, that's happening in our churches now today, right? We have abominations. Again, it is written from the rising of the sun into the setting of the same. My name shall be great among the Gentiles. Think about that, guys. So a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish. So I'm not Jewish. I'm completely of European descent as a white American. Um, I'm a Gentile. Most of you listening are probably Gentiles. Now, at this point, when Jesus was here in um, alive, you know, doing, doing his thing 2,000 years ago, this was all very much an Abrahamic Jewish faith. The Gentiles, the Romans, were conquering or the bad guys at this point, right? And Jesus is saying, just hold on, like my name is going to resonate with all men. 
And we see that now. That would must have been a really hard concept for the disciples back then to understand that this Jewish faith was going to become one of the main religions followed by even the Gentiles. It goes on to say, But ye have made a desolation with your offerings of blood, and used the sweet incest only to cover the ill savor thereof. I come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So again, he's talking about how these animalistic and human sacrifices are just not okay. That he was the sacrifice. Leave innocent blood alone. Know ye not what is written? Obedience is better than sacrifice, and to hearken them the fat of rams. I, the Lord, am weary of your burnt offerings and your your vain oblations, your hands are full of blood. And is it not written, what is the true sacrifice? Wash you and make you clean and put away the evils from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, do justice for the fatherless and the widow and all that are, are oppressed. So doing ye shall fulfill the law. The day cometh when all that which is in the outer court which pertaineth to blood offerings shall be taken away and the pure worshipers shall worship the eternal in purity and in truth. And they said, who art thou that seeketh to do away with the sacrifice and despiseth the seed of Abraham from the Greeks and the Egyptians? Hast thou learned this blasphemy? And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And they refused to listen. And some said he is inspired by a demon. And others said he is mad. And they went their way and told these things to the priests and the elders. And they were wrath, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. We come now to lection 50, Christ the light of the world. Verse 1 says, Then spoke Jesus again, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. So the Pharisees are questioning Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record for myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I come and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone. I came from the father mother who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself. John bore witness of me, and he is a prophet. And the spirit of truth that sent me beareth witness of me. They say unto him, Why, Where is thy father and mother? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my parent. If you had known me, ye would have known my father and my mother also. And one said, Show us father, show us mother, and we will believe thee. And he answered, saying, If thou hast seen my brother and felt his love, thou hast seen the father. If thou have seen my sister and felt her love, thou hast seen the mother. So law, the law of love is God. That's a line from Victor Hugo's Le Miserable. To love another person is to see the face of God. Far and near, the all holy knoweth their own. Ye and each of you, the fatherhood and the motherhood may be seen. For the father and the mother are one in God. These words spoke Jesus in the treasury and he taught them in the temple. And no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. Then says Jesus again unto them, I go my way and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Whether I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, and I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die for your sins. For if ye believe that I am not God, ye shall die in your sins. So basically he's saying, like, If you don't believe that I'm here to die for you and pay your price, then you're going to have to pay your own price. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I am unto you from the beginning. And the same here is spelled with a capital S. So again, I believe that's referring back to Didymus or the Gospel of Thomas, where he says we are, we are the same. We are the same as Jesus. We are children of God. Jesus just came to remind us of that. And they said, I have said many things to say which shall judge you, but the Holy One that sent me is true, and I speak to the world 
those things which I have heard from above. And Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am sent from God, and I do nothing of myself, but as the whole, all holy hath taught me, I speak these things. Who sent me is with me, the all holy hath left me alone, for I do always those things with pleasure, pleasing the eternal. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him, for they said, He is the prophet sent from God. Him let us hear. And that concludes section five. So now we are moving on to section six. This starts off with lection 51, the truth maketh free. Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant, not in the house forever, but the son and even the daughter, abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed after the flesh, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my parents, and ye do that which you have seen with your parents. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. A man hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your parent, ye would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but the all-holy sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth of him. And he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. As Moses lifted up the serpent into the wilderness, so must the son and daughter of man be lifted up. And whoever gave this believing should not perish, but have everlasting life. Which of you con convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He hath this of God, heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and half a demon. Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor the all holy. And ye do dishonor me, and I seek not mine own glory, but the glory of God. But there is one who judgeth. And certain of the elders and scribes from the temple came unto him, saying, Why do thy disciplines teach men that this is unlawful to eat the flesh of beast when they offer in sacrifice as by Moses ordained? For it is written, God said to Noah, The fear and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field and every bird of the air and every fish of the sea. With your hands they are delivered. And Jesus said unto them, Ye hypocrites, when did Isaiah speak of you and your forefathers, saying, This people draw the night unto me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me? For in vain do they worship me, teaching and believing, and teaching for the divine doctrines and the commandments of men in my name, but to satisfy their own lust. That's powerful, guys, because I, I see that a lot. I get a lot of, actually, I personally get a lot of people who claim to be Christian that will um, email me and tell me I'm going to hell because my faith is different from theirs or my faith looks a little bit um, more open than theirs. And that's a sin. That's a sin. That's, that's feeling in your own pride and ego if you feel like you have the right to tell somebody else their fate with God. 
And Jesus just said that, that that is satisfying your own lust for evil. So that's something we should all think about. We don't have a right to tell somebody what their fate is. That's up to God and God alone. As also Jeremiah bear witness when he saith concerning blood offerings and sacrifice, I, the Lord, command none of these things in the day that ye came out of Egypt. But, I only, but only this commandment to you I do, righteousness, walk in the ancient paths, do, judge, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. So obviously the, a lot of the animal sacrifices were picked up from the Jewish people's time in Egypt, right? There's a lot of references to what they learned in Egypt. Verse 16 says, But ye did not hearken to me, who in the beginnings gave you all manner of seed and fruits of the tree, and seed having been for the food and the healing of the man and the beast. And they said, Thou speakest against the law. And he said against Moses, Indeed I do not speak, nor against the law, but against them who corrupted his law, which he permitted for the hardness of your hearts. But behold, a greater than Moses is here, and they were wrath and took up stones to cast at him. And Jesus passed through their midst and was hidden from their violence. Lection 52 says, he declareth his pre-existence. Another time Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man kept my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know thou hast a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom he say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, for I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know the all holy, and am known of the eternal. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet forty-five years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, I verily I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And he said unto them, The all holy hath sent you many prophets, but ye rose against them all, and were contrary to your lust, reviling some and slaying others. And they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple through the midst of them, and so again passed unseen by then. Again, when his disciples were with him in a place apart, one of them asked him concerning the kingdom and said unto him, As it is above, so it is below. As it is within, so it is without. As on the right hand, so on the left hand. As it is before, so it is behind. As with the great, so with the small. As with the male, so with the female. When these things shall be seen, then ye shall see the kingdom of God. For in me there is neither male nor female, but both are one in all perfect. The woman is not without the man, nor the man without the woman. Wisdom is not without love, nor is love without wisdom. The head is not without the heart, nor is the heart without the head. In the Christ who atoneth all things. For God hath made all things by number, by weight and by measure, corresponding with one the other. These things are for them that understand to believe. If they understand not, they are not for them. For to believe is to understand, and to believe not is to not understand. Lection 53, Jesus healeth the blind on the Sabbath. And at another time, Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, To what purpose is it, whether this man sinned or his parents? So what purpose is it? It's spelled purpose. This Old English sometimes is very complicated to decipher. But he's basically saying, what's the purpose of the sin for his parents to make him blind so that the works of God are made manifest in him? I must work the works of my parent who sent me while it is in this day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Talking about like stuff your parents do to cause something in you, that's another form of karma, the ancestral karma, just FYI, we have the three karmas, our own karma, our own work we have to do, the work of our ancestors, and the collective work of ourselves. 
Verse 3 says, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and mingled clay with the spittle and anointed his eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool. And he went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. We saw this again in the Acts of Philip, where Philip did basically the same thing that Jesus had taught him, to, to heal somebody's eye with spit. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind and said, is not this he that sat and begged? And someone said, this is he. Others said, he is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? And he answered, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then say they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not where he is that made me whole. Then came to him certain who deny that there is such a resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote upon us, If any man's brother die having a wife and leaving children, that his brother shall take his wife and raise up her seed to his brother. Now there were six brethren, and the first took a wife, and he died childless. And the seven took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third, even unto the sixth, and they all died, leaving no children. Last of all, the woman also died. Now the resurrection, whose of them is she? For the six had her to wife. And Jesus answered, saying, Whether a woman with six husbands or a man with six wives, the case is the same. For the children of this would marry and are given in marriage. But they which being worthy obtain to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given the marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord, the God Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for he is not the God of dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Lection 54 says, The examination of him who is born blind. When they brought to the Pharisees him that foretone was blind, and it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, which again we've already discussed in this gospel. That that basically Jesus was like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. If you have the love of God in your heart, it doesn't matter if you're working on the Sabbath or not. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he raised his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath holy. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. That's confusing, right? Like he's not following the law, but yet he's performing miracles. Like what's going on? They say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him and received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he see now? His parents answered them and said, We know that he is our son and that he was born blind. But what means he now seeth we know not, nor who hath opened his eyes? He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spoke his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he shall be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is one of age. Ask him. So they're scared of these church leaders or these temple leaders, the rabbis, the Pharisees. Then it Again, called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know that where I was blind, now I see. Then said they again to him, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, as for his fellow, we know not from whence he comes. And the man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now ye know that God heareth not sinners." 
But if any man be a worshiper of God and doth his will, he will hear it. Since the world began, was it not heard that many men opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I come into the world, that they which see not might not see, and they which see might be made blind. For some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus, when he came to a certain place where seven palm trees grew, gathered his disciples around him to each and gave him a number and name in which he only knew who received it. And he said unto them, Stand ye as pillars in the house of God and show forth the order according to your numbers which you have received. And they stood around him and they made him body four square, and they counter the number, and they could not. And they said unto him, Lord, we cannot. And Jesus said, Let who is greatest among you be even as the least, and the symbol of which is first be as the symbol of which is the last. And they did so, even in every way there was equality. And yet each bore a different number, and the one side was the up other, and the upper was the lower, and the inner the outer. And the Lord said, It is enough. Such is the house of the wise builder, for squareth it is, the perfect many are the chambers, but the house is one. Again, consider the body of man, which is the temple of the spirit. For the body is one, united to its head, which is the one body, and it has many members, yet all are one body, and the one spirit ruleth and worketh in all, so also in the kingdom. And the head doth not say to the bosom, I have no need for thee nor the right hand to the left, I have no need for thee, nor the left foot to the right, I have no need for thee, neither the eyes to the ears, we have no need for you, nor the mouth to the nose, I have no need for thee, for God hath set it in one body ever, member as it is fitting. If the whole were the head, where were the beast? If the whole were the belly, where were the feet? If those members which some affirm are less honorable, Upon them hath God bestowed the more honor. And those parts which some call uncommonly upon them hath been bestowed more abundant comeliness, that they may care one for the other. So if one member suffers, all members suffered with it. And if one member it is honored, all members rejoice. Now ye are my body, and each one of you is a member in particular. And to each one of you I do give the fitting place and one head over all, and one heart center over all, that there be may be no lack nor schism, that so with your bodies, your soul, and your spirits may be glory, all the parent through the divine spirit, which worketh in all through all. Lexin 55, Christ the Good Shepherd, one with the Father. At the time there passed by way a shepherd leading his flock to the fold, and Jesus took up one of his young lambs in his arms and talked to it lovingly and pressed it to his bosom. And he spoke with his disciples saying, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and known of mine as the parent of knoweth me. Even so I know my sheep and lay down my life for my sheep and the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. I lay down my life that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay my body down and I have power to take it up again. Basically, he can bring himself back to life, right? And we see that later on in the story. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd feedeth his flock. He gathereth his lamb in his arms and he carrieth them into the bosom and gently leadeth them that they are young Yea, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf cometh and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. 
the hireling fleet because he is a hireling and careth not for his sheep. So a bad shepherd doesn't protect his flock, whereas Jesus does. I am the door. By me, all who enter shall be safe, shall go in and come out and find pasture. The evil one cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He that entereth in by the door in the shepherd of the sheep to whom the porter open and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his sheep by name and leadeth them out and he knoweth the number. And when he put forth his sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And as a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, for they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My parent who gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my parent's hand. I and my parent are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to him. God, they really are having a hard time with Jesus, aren't they? (laughs) Jesus answered them, Many good workers have I shown you from my parent, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou art being a man, maketh thyself equal with God. Jesus answered them, said that I am equal to God. Nay, but I am one with God. It is not written in the scriptures. I said, ye are gods. So he's not saying he's equal to God. He's saying he's one with God, that God is with him. Interesting, right? If he call them gods unto whom the word God came and the scriptures cannot be broken, say ye of him, whom the parent of all how have sanctioned and sent into the world. Thou blasphemy, because I said I'm the son of God and therefore am one with all the parent. And if we do, I do not speak the words of my parents, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the spirit of the great parent is in me and that I am my parent. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hands and went away again beyond Jordan into a place where John was first baptized and where he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John indeed did not miracles. He is the prophet that should come and many believed on him. So now we're at section 55, the rising of Lazarus. And this is interesting because it kind of goes back to um, Mary of Bethany. And if you guys joined us for our Acts of Philip episode, Mary of Bethany or Miriam of Bethany, who was often with uh, Mary Magdalene, was Philip's wife. Now we understand that Mary was uh, Mary of Bethany, Miriam of Bethany, was... um, the sister, possibly, of Lazarus, the guy who is about to be risen from the dead. Well, the first verse here, we get some clarity on who it was that wiped Jesus' feet. So let's read on. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with the ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So now we have clarification. No, it was not Mary of Magdalene, the Magdalene, that wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, but Mary of Bethany, who again was Philip's wife. She plays a huge part in the acts of Philip. Verse 2 said, Therefore his sister sent upon him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not upon death, but that the glory of God might be manifest in him. Now, Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. Again, Mary's sister, Martha. When he heard that he was sick, he abode two days till in the same place where he was. Then after that, he saith to his disciples, disciples, excuse me, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou hither again? It's dangerous. It's dangerous to go into Judea now. And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walketh in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of his world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, 
And after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I make him awake out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. And a messenger came unto him, saying, Lazarus is dead. Now when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave four days already. Bethany was night unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furloughs off. So, different times, right? And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, and Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother has not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, he will give thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother sleepeth, and he shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again at the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the light. Whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. She said unto him, Ye Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should cometh into the world. And when he had said, she went her way and called Mary her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, calling, following her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping that came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where and have he ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then said Jesus, Behold how loved he is. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore groaning again in himself, for he feared that he might already be dead, cometh to the grave, if the cave and the stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha, the sister of him, supposed to be dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where Lazarus was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and chanting, invoked the great name and said, My parent, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, for I know that thou hast heard me. But because of my people which stand by, I call upon thee that they may believe thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice and Lazarus came forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with glove cloths, and his face was bound with a napkin, kind of like a mummy, right? And Jesus said unto him, Lose him, let him go. When the threads of the life is cut, indeed, it cometh not again. But when it is whole, there is hope. There were many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did and believed him. So just more miracles proving that he was who he said he was. Lection 57, Concerning Little Children, the Forgiveness of Those Who Trespass, Parable of the Fishes. At the same time came the disciple unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be covered it, and become innocent and teachable as a little child, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever there shall humble himself as the little child, the same is the greatness of the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to the man by whom the offenses cometh. 
who for each thy lusts or thy pleasure do offend others, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life without than having that which will cast into everlasting life. Take heed that ye neglected not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of God, for the Son of Man is come to save the world which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, that one of them be gone astray? Doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoice more over the sheep than over the ninety-nine which went not astray. Even so, to it not the will of your parents, who is in heaven, the one of these little should perish? That there are certain men of doubtful mind come unto Jesus and said unto him, Thou tellest us that our life and being is from God, but we have never seen God, nor do we know any God. Canst thou show us whom thou call the Father, Mother, one God? We know not if there be a God. And Jesus answered them, saying, Hear ye this parable of the fishes. The fishes of a certain river communed with one another, saying, They tell us that our lives and being is from water, but we have never seen water. We know not what our is. Then some among them, wiser than the rest, said, We have heard there dwelleth in the sea a wise and learned fish who knoweth all things. Let us journey to him and ask him to show us what water is. So several of them set out to find the great and wise fish. They came at last to the sea, wherein the wise fish dwelt. And they asked of him. And when he heard them, he said unto them, O ye foolish fish, fish that consider not, wise are ye, the few who seek. In the water ye live and move and have your being. From the water ye come to the water ye return. Ye live in the water, yet ye know it not. In this manner ye live in God, and yet ye ask me, show us God. God is in all things, and all things are in God. My teacher in India says, you know, all we're looking all, all seeing God. So wherever you're looking, you're seeing, you're seeing God. Again, Jesus said unto them, If thy brother and sister shall trespass against thee, go and declare the fault between them and thy brother or sister alone. For if they shall hear thee, they shall hast gain them. For if they will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if they shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if they neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. He says it twice, twice, right? Let them be unto those as those are outside of the church. Verily I say unto you, whoever ye shall just, justly bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever ye shall justly lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, thou, if seven or even if three of you shall were of my father and mother who is in heaven. For where even three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. And if there are but one, I am in the heart of that one. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shalt my brother sin against me that I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I am the, I am, excuse me, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. For in the prophet likewise unrighteousness was found, even after they were anointed by the Holy Spirit. It's like God doesn't pick the prepared. There's kind of a I'm paraphrasing that saying, God doesn't pick the people who are prepared. He prepares the people who are picked to do his job, right? We're all fallible. Perfection is not ever really going to be, to be obtained, but through God, there can be corrections made. And he spoke of this parable saying, there was a certain king who would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for so much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had payments to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosened him and forgave him his debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee. 
and he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay his debts. Well, hypocrisy, right? We should not be hypocritical. So when the fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told upon their Lord all that was done. Then the Lord, after he had called upon, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debts because that because thou desirest me. Should not thou also have compassion for thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to torment, shall he should pay all that was due to him. For it likewise shall be heavenly parent judge you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one, for his brother and sister their trespasses. Nevertheless, let every man see that he pay that which he oweth, for God loveth the just." Lection 58 is divine love to the repentant. Jesus said unto the disciples and to the multitudes around them, who is the son of God? Who is the daughter of God? Even in the company of them who turn from evil and do righteousness, love mercy and walk reverently with their God. These are the sons and daughters from a man who come up out of Egypt to whom it is given and they should be called the sons and daughter of God. And they are gathered from all tribes and nations and peoples and tongues. And they came from the east and the west and the north and the south. And they dwell on Mount Zion and they eat bread and they drink of the fruit of the vine at the table of God. And they see God face to face. They draw near unto him all the tax gatherers and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with him. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness to go after that one which is lost until he find it? So again, he's reminding them of that very famous parable that we also see in the canonized Bible. And when he hath found it, he laid it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cameth home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either that what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and seek it diligently till she find it, and which she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece of silver which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he also spoke this parable. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his parents, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And they divided upon him their, their living. And not many days after the youngest son gathered all together and took his journey into a fair country, there wasted his substance with righteous living. This is, again, the, the parable of the, the son that comes back from the Bible. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And he would have fain have filled his body with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to eat and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and mother, and I will say unto thee, My father and mother, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his parents, but they... But he was a great way off. <clears throat> Excuse me. His mother and his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. <clears throat> and the son said unto him, My father and my mother, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the best ripe fruits and the bread and the oil and the wine and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now this elder son was in the field and he came and drew nights to the house and heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what of these things meant. <clears throat> And he said unto him, Thy brother who was lost is come back, and thy father and thy mother have prepared the bread and the oil and the wine and the best ripe fruits, because they received him safe and sound. 
and he was angry and would not go in. Therefore he came his father out and entreated him. And he answered, said to his father, Lo, these many years I have served thee, neither transgressed I at any time by thy commandments, and yet thou never gavest me such a godly feast that I may maketh merry with my friends. And as soon as thus thy son is come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou preparest him a feast of the beast, and thou hast. And his father said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet, therefore, that we should be merry, to be glad for thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and now is found. Lection 59, Jesus forewarneth his disciples, he finds Zacharias. And Jesus went into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples and taught them. And he said unto him, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and do what is good for them which have not. Provide yourself bags with which wax not old, and treasures in heaven that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will also be your heart. Let your loins be girded about, and your light burning, and ye yourselves like unto men, and wait for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding, that he doth cometh and knock, they may be open unto him immediately. So there's also reference in Revelation in the canonized Bible of a bride and a wedding, which could also be reference to a lifting of the veil, because a bride wears a veil on her wedding day. The wedding is what actually lifts the veil. So I find that very interesting, just as a side note. Verse 4 said, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that she, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down at a table and one come forth and serve them. And he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed, rare those servants. And this know that their guardian of the house, not knowing what hour the thief would come, would have watched and not suffered his house to have broken through. But ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So again, this is this is returning. This is him preparing his disciples for the second coming, which I, I believe we're in right now. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And Lord said, Whom then is the faithful and the wise steward, whom this Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them who've served their portion in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth, I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if that servant say in thy heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maid servants and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour when he is not aware and will appoint him portions with the unfaithful. And that servant which he knew his Lord's will prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whoever much is given of him shall they be required the less. For they who know the Godhead and found in the way of light the mysteries of light and have fallen into sin shall be punished with greater punishments than they who have not known the way of the life. Such shall return when their cycle is complete to them and will be given space to consider and amend their lives, learning the mysteries to enter the kingdom of heaven. So that, again, to me, is reincarnation. What he's saying, they're going to come back to understand the kingdoms of heaven until they finally get it, right? So we're not doomed. We're not all doomed. We, we get time to understand this mystery. And Jesus entered, passing through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacharias, which was the chief among the collectors of the tribe, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus, Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zechariah, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him. 
And when he saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacharias stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken away from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to thine house for so much as thou art just a man. Thou art the son of Abraham, for the son of man is come to seek and save that which ye deem to be lost. Lection 60, Jesus rebuketh hypocrisy. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not do. So they basically, again, it's rules for me, but not, or excuse me, rules for thee, but not for me. He's calling the rabbis, the Pharisees that claim to be Moses' descendants, he's calling them hypocrites. They're, don't do what they do. Don't do what they do. We could say that very, um, very. I could say that very uh, assuredly about some some of the pastors we have in today's world, for sure. Not all of them, but some. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're not even helping people, is what Jesus is saying. Not only are they hypocrites, but they're not even helping people. It's all their their power is done in selfishness and evil, not in love. But with all their works, they do for to be seen of men. (laughs) Again, they're doing it for the lust for power. And enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feast. And the chiefs sit in the synagogues and greetings in the market to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. So basically, they're just rabbis in name for power and ego is what God is saying. Not because or Jesus is saying, not because um, they actually want to help people. But desirest not ye to be called a rabbi, for one is your rabbi, even in Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call not any one father on earth, for earth are fathers in the flesh only, but in heaven there is one, who is your father and your mother, who hath the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. So again, this goes back to the policies of the church, the political church or temple. You know, we have these preachers, we have these priests, and they're they're supposed to be um, authorities in in the Christian faith, and in this time, Jesus is speaking in the Jewish faith, but he's saying that's not true. There are no authorities in this faith because we are all equal in God's eyes. Neither desire ye to be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ, but they are all greatest among you, shall be your servants, and whoever shall be exalted themselves shall be abyssed, and that they are humbled and themselves shall be exalted. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye can pass sea and land to make one prostulate. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more than the child of hell than yourself. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, who say, Whoever shall swear by the temple is nothing. But whoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor, ye fools and blind. For whether is greater the gold or the temple and the sancteth of gold. And whoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind. For whether is great the gift of the altar and the sacrifice of the gift? Whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And who shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he shall swear by heaven, and sweareth by the throne of God, and by the one holy sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of mint, and anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, for ye strand out a gnat, and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup, 
and the platter, but within they are full of extortation and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is with one cup and platter, then the outside of them, that they may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white and spectulars, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of bones of the dead and all the uncleanliness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and make believe. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish that of the righteousness and say, if I had been in the day of our fathers, we would not have been partaken with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherever ye be witness unto yourself, that ye do as children, for them which killeth the prophet, fill ye up with the measures of your fathers. Wherefore, saith holy wisdom, Behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men, and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge within your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city, and upon you shall call, come all righteous bloodshed upon the earth." from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, who was slain between the temple and the altar. Verily, I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, now your health house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till you say, holy, 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 blessed are they who come in the name of the just one. So Jesus, basically, we're going to leave it today um, at the end of section six. Next week, we'll do seven and um, eight will be our sections we cover. But Jesus basically just went off on the uh, the rabbis and the Pharisees and the, the priest of the um, Jerusalem faith that, that the uh, temples are, are corrupt. And they're not, they're hypocrites. They're not following the will of God, but they're following the will of their own greed and lust, which is the will of man. And that's definitely, definitely a mirror of what's happening today in our own religious churches, synagogues, temples, etc. So again, next week we'll pick back up. Next Wednesday we'll pick back up with um, section seven and eight. We have 10 sections, so we'll be doing this for a few more weeks to get through the whole gospel. Also, please join us over on the Dark Outpost on Tuesday nights where we actually break this down. I give a little bit of commentary when I'm reading through this, but on David's channel, we have a lot of time to really talk about it and break it down. And, um, and I would love for you guys to join us over there because it definitely gets way more involved over there. So anyway, thank you so much, guys, for sitting through this. I know it's another long episode. Um, thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, the link is below. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this out to you guys. I hope you're all having a fantastic day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Close to hell.